Hello everyone and welcome to Swift Heroes. Hope okay. you're all May well I ask the person who is presenting it? I'm Gian Piero the slide from started at... IOS team. We are proud to be prime sponsors of the event and we are waiting for you folks to join our virtual stand. Thank you and enjoy the conference. There we go. Thank you very much. All right. So just setting this up. OK. Hi, everyone. My name is Bruno Rocha. I'm an iOS engineer at Spotify. And today, I want to talk about how giant apps like Spotify are architected. I want to show you how you can evolve an application that has hundreds of features while you're still having a good degree of flexibility and fast build times. We're going to pretend that we're making our own giant app and then see how Spotify specifically makes it all work. But before we get to that, there you go. Before we get to that, I would like to talk a bit about how you reach this point in the first place. Like every other app, Spotify also had its share of architectural issues. It didn't immediately start it as an app with its own dependency injection engine. It looked just like any other app in the beginning. And as that app kept growing, we started having issues that could only be fixed by changing how the architecture of the app looked like. So instead of just telling you how Spotify did things, I would like to first navigate you through the evolution process of an iOS app so you can understand why Spotify and other large companies decided to adopt some of the patterns that we are going to show here. If we pretend that we have a very simple single view app and start evolving it with more features, we're going to be able to visualize what kinds of problems we're going to face and what we have to do to solve them. So we're going to start this talk by visualizing this evolution. Let's assume that we started a new company and after some weeks of development, we created an app that looks just like this. It's a single module app that contains everything about this app. We know nothing about modularization and we also don't really care about the architecture of the app. Everything relies on singletons. And because our features are not complicated, it's not a problem for us to have something simple like MVC and just be done with it. Also, because the project is too simple, we also don't have any unit tests. So don't expect to see protocols or any sort of composition in this project. But here's a very important detail. When we want to navigate somewhere in this app, we're going to explicitly reference the view controller we want to navigate to. So if I want to push my view controller, we're going to directly create an instance of it and push it. This may sound a little obvious because if we don't have a super complicated navigation system, then this or storyboards is really the only way you, we can do this. But try to remember this very specific detail because this is gonna become a huge problem later on when this app gets the size of something like Spotify. Anyway, what we're seeing here is every, pretty much everyone's first ever app. And we can say that this format is fine if you're developing something simple. As long as your features aren't complex, this will likely solve your problem and turn out to be a pretty stable app. We can call this a level one app, something simple and straightforward that everyone starts with. Now let's assume that our company earned a lot of money and we are now evolving this app. We may, we may have new developers in this team, and together we added a few more features to this app. Even though this is a larger app, it is still small enough to, for things to work properly. You, you will probably not have any module-related issues like slow build time, so we don't need to make any changes into how the app itself is structured yet. However, you might start worrying about what the internal architecture of the app looks like. If you have too many features, you want to make sure that they are properly isolated and that the changes made to a specific feature don't end up affecting the others. So this is a point in time where developers might start experimenting with protocol-oriented programming. And by replacing that older MVC with an architecture that contains different components, we might be able to build a distant enough unit testing bundle. 
On that same note, for the purpose of testability in isolation, we might have stopped using those boring singletons and replaced them by actual dependency injection to the constructor. This can be called our level two app. And so far, nothing here might mean news to you. That's just how your usual small scale iOS development works. But it's important to visualize this evolution to understand what's going to happen from now on. Let's jump a few months to the future and assume that we kept growing this app as it is. This is where we're going to start having some real problems. It doesn't matter how great your MVVM, J, K, Z, whatever jumbo of letters you chose for your architecture. If you're packing this amount of code into a single module, you're going to start having some real problems. There you go. Hold on. Lost my notes. There you go. We're going to start having some real problems. Uh, we can say, like, you're going to start having build issues, even if you're using Xcode incremental builds. Uh, and the problem is the single module format that we have. We can say that the result of compiling our module here will result in a library. So if we cram all of this code into a single module, it doesn't matter if what you change is small because you're always going to have to invalidate your entire current cache module so you can generate a new one that contains your changes. Thankfully, this is a well-documented problem in the world of iOS development. This is the point where developers will realize that they, they can improve their application by dividing their code into multiple modules. The functionality of the app is essentially the same as before, but you're minimizing what needs to be recompiled slash regenerated every time you make a change to this app. A very common example of modularization in iOS development is to create a module for each feature slash framework of the app, like networking, onboarding, home, and, and so on. If one module for some reason requires access to another one, for example, to push up your controller that is stored in another module, they can simply define a dependency to it. Under this example scenario here, if I make a change to the feature flagging module, Xcode is not going to need to recompile the home and networking models because their dependency graphs have no connection to my changes. This allows Xcode to reuse the same modules that cache the last time they got compiled, which can save us a lot of time. But you also have the possibility of using this module independently from the rest of the app, which allows you to iterate changes a lot faster if you're coding something that doesn't require actually launching the app. We can call this a level three app. And I would say it's how most medium to large apps out there look out nowadays. But okay, now that we presented all of this background and context, we can start understanding what happens when an app's gets the site of Spotify. Let's assume that we took our level three app and started adding an infinite amount of features without making any changes to our, in our architecture. First of all, not only we're going to start having build problems again, we, we also have to deal with the fact that we are going to start having several new and much harder issues to, to fix. And this graph is actually an understatement Spotify has well over 300 modules in the app. This might sound surprising since we didn't have anything like this in the previous levels, but it's because we're now dealing with a different kind of issue. From level one to level three, our problems were mostly related to the code that we were writing. But now the problems are the modules themselves. They helped us build faster code before, but if we have too many of them, we need to be careful about how they are laid out. So let's take a look at what some of these issues are. First of all, if these are being compiled as dynamic frameworks, then the app is gonna start taking a long time to launch. That's because dynamic frameworks are linked in runtime. The app only truly launches when these frameworks are loaded into memory. So the more modules we have, the longer this process takes. And for an app the size of Spotify, this delay is very noticeable. Fortunately, this is a very simple issue to solve. We can improve this by using static libraries instead. And like dynamic frameworks, static libraries are linked when the app's compiled by shipping said libraries directly in the app's binary. This may have the side effect of slightly increasing the size of the app, but it can greatly improve the launch time of the app under this scenario. Unfortunately, the other issues are, are not as straightforward. 
do you remember back in that level one app where I asked you to remember how we were navigating the UI of the app? This is the point where those explicit references between different components of the app come back to bite us. The concept of pushing view controllers by explicitly referencing them is fine, but this has one important and big downside. If the view controller I'm looking for is in another library, then I'm going to need these explicit references, these dependencies actually, between the modules. This is not too much of a problem if you have 10 or so modules, but if you have 300, you're going to start having those build problems we had back then all over again. Modularizing the app helped us reduce the amount of code that was recompiled in incremental builds, but it didn't really solve the problem, it just diminished it. When you build incrementally in Xcode, you're not just recompiling what you changed, you also recompile what is affected by the change. We already know that this is going to cause the module itself to be invalidated. But if I have something that depends on that module, then that module is also going to be invalidated. And if something depends on that thing, it will also have to be invalidated, so on and so forth recursively. This is actually a very common problem. And is why you may find yourself in a situation where changing something small, like the type of a property, actually ends up causing a huge chunk, if not the entire project, to be rebuilt. To make matters worse, these direct dependencies may also put yourself in a situation where it is difficult to make changes in the app. If these view controllers or whatever other objects we're creating have dependencies that we need to pass, we may need to carry over these dependencies all the way across the modules. This is gonna make your classes end up with dozens of parameters that they don't even need to the point where tasks that are normally supposed to be easy actually end up being extremely complicated just due to the raw complexity of these classes. Your app is gonna become very unflexible and any large changes like adding new screens in the middle of the flow might actually become impossible without rewriting huge chunks of the app. This is actually very common. As we saw before, our problem now is connected to the architecture of the modules themselves. Our issue is that our module, our app, has vertical dependencies. Each module stacks up the dependencies of the module that comes after it, even if they have no need for them. So to solve our issues, we must destroy these connections. If we prevent feature modules from depending on other feature modules, we are going to be able to say that our modules are horizontal between each other, which eliminates the incremental build issues we are facing. But what does this mean for navigation? Don't we actually need these dependencies for an app to work? The answer is actually not really. If you assume that we have a navigation framework of some sort that allows you to reference view controllers without explicitly depending on the actual view controller type, we're going to have the ability to navigate anywhere we want, from anywhere we want, without needing to import or change anything in our app. This is what we can call a level four app, and it's how Spotify and other really big apps out there work. Because the modules don't depend on each other, developers can consistently add new feature modules without having to worry about how the rest of the app works. They can develop their feature in isolation and simply plug their finished module into the app without having issues with incremental build times. So now that we have seen the architecture and the theory behind it, let's take a look at how this actually works in Spotify. One important thing to ask yourself is, wait a second, if there are no dependencies between these modules, then how can I actually use something that exists in another module? It doesn't make any sense. To answer that, we need to first change our concept of modules. In a level four app, it's not that you can't depend on anything. The problem is depending on concrete implementations like view controllers or any other piece of like really heavy business logic. Those things are likely to change all the time and to carry dependencies that you probably don't need to do a particular task. So if you are actually depending on them, you would probably have a big issue to deal with. On the other hand, it should be perfectly fine for us to depend on APIs like protocols or other pieces of trivial extensions. So our first step towards a level four app is to divide our modules into two. 
instead of having a single module that contains everything, we are going to grab everything that is meant to be referenced, like protocol APIs, and move them to a separate API module. If a different feature wants to reference those protocols, then their concrete module can freely depend on the relevant API module. This is the only thing they're allowed to depend on. They should never depend on the concrete implementation modules because that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. This ensures that the modules are properly isolated from each other in the dependency graph, preventing them from being invalidated between builds. Wait a second. Aren't these dependencies here still an issue? In theory, yes, but in practice, not really. Why the incremental build time problem we talked about still exists here? This division between concrete and API modules will make it a lot less likely. We know that most of our work will be done in these concrete modules. So because they are isolated in the graph, we won't really have any build issues as a result. We may see these issues if we change the APIs themselves, but that should not be a common occurrence. Protocols don't change a lot, so we find API targets to be very stable. But we still haven't mentioned the most important aspect of a level four app. If I cannot depend on concrete modules, then, then how does these implementations get passed around from module to module? If I can't reference them, then I cannot instantiate them. Like The APIs are not enough. I need the actual concrete type that is implementing those things. This is the biggest architectural difference when you develop a giant application like Spotify. While in the previous levels, we were referencing classes directly and navigating between view controllers by manually injecting objects and initializers and so on. In an app the size of Spotify, we need to have a central engine that is capable of coordinating the modules inside the app. This engine knows every single module that the app contains and uses this information to handle the app's dependency injection. This is how this engine works. Although the concrete modules cannot depend on each other, there's always going to be a framework that imports everything. This is going to be the lowest module in your dependency graph, where your app delegate is most likely going to be. When your app first launches, this main target is in a unique position to build a list of all available features in the app and the APIs that they are capable of providing. If at some point of the app, a feature requires access to something that belongs to another feature, this feature can send an API request back to the central engine. Now, the engine knows about all the modules in the app, so it can use the list that we created earlier on to locate which of these features can provide that API, fetch it, and inject it back at the module that requested it. At Spotify, this engine is called the SPT service system. Its purpose is to manage the life cycle of a graph of services, completely abstracting the process of injecting dependencies, loading content, and cleaning them up when they are not needed anymore. The entire Spotify app works around these services. Every module contains at least one of them, allowing us to build a completely horizontal app where every dependency is injected in runtime. But what is a service? Well, we can say that a service at Spotify is basically a class that holds some state and can expose some APIs. Let's suppose that we have a module at Spotify that is called not working. We can say that this module is essentially a HTTP client SDK, and perhaps we would, we would like some other features to be able to access our backend without needing to explicitly depend on this module. Sorry. The networking module can achieve this by implementing a networking service class that maybe contains some APIs related to networking. Now, to allow other features to use these APIs, the networking module will expose the service to the service system, which is going to keep note of the fact that the networking module is capable of answering requests for that very specific network API protocol. If at some point later in the app, a different service wants to access those functionalities, the service system will know where to provide it from. The module that requested it doesn't even know that the object is a network service, like the concrete implementation, only that it is something that implements that networking protocol we are requesting. This is what allows us to have the horizontal dependencies we talked about. The modules never need to import each other, which gives us the isolation that we need. 
Additionally, every service is part of a service scope. In general, scopes are nothing more than a label that we give to a specific group of services. But this is very important for access control purposes because the scopes essentially define when certain services are going to be available for usage. For example, let's say that I have a service that exposes some information about the user. I obviously cannot use this service if the app has just launched. I'm only going to be able to use it if the user is actually logged in. So we should grab every service that is related to the logging service, the logging process of the app, and say that they compose a group of logged in services. These services are only going to be accessible if this scope is available, and services are outside the scope. We will not be able to use them unless their scopes have an explicit dependency to it. The main point of this is simply to provide some form of access control to the service system, but it also allows us to visualize what these Spotify apps looks like. If a scope has too many services, then it is likely that we have some architectural issue in the app, and that probably something needs to be refactored. Let's see what the code for a service looks like. A developer at Spotify can create a service by defining a class that inherits from SPT service and the API that the service is supposed to implement. Let's assume that we're creating a service called Siri Intents, which provides an API that talks to iOS's Intents SDK. A service has three requirements. We must first define its identifier, which is how other services will be able to reference this. In this case, I'm going to want to connect my service to the Siri Intents API protocol. A service is also able to have a load method, which is what's called when the service is first initialized. The purpose of the load method is to give the service a chance to do some early setup before other services can access it, like setting up any straight properties or similar things. We also have unload, which gives the service a chance to clean up its state before it gets released by the service system. Services are going to be unloaded when the scope they are attached to becomes unreachable. Uh, for example, if the user logs out, then there's no point in keeping a user session service in memory. The service system will then unload all services from that particular scope and deallocate them. Additionally, services can depend on other services. We can use the API modules of other services to indicate to the service system that our service wants to access whatever value is implementing these APIs. When the service system decides to load this particular service, it will inject itself into these dependency property wrappers, which is what obstructs the process we saw before in where a module can actually request the service system to provide the object that implements this specific protocol. But notice how the imports here are always API modules. As we have seen by now, we don't need to import the actual concrete modules because these dependencies are resolved in runtime by the service system. With our service created, we should now expose it to the service system. For your simplicity, we have abstracted the process by allowing developers to create a YAML file that contains a list of all services in a particular model, as well as the services that they are supposed to belong to, uh, the scopes they are supposed to belong to, sorry. Uh, these YAML files are processed when the developers generate our Xcode project, in where the contents of these files, they are going to be converted to a list in the app delegate that actually exposes all services available in the app. So this is converted to actual code. But now that our services are up and running, let's see how the service system itself works. When the app is launched, the purpose of the app delegate is to set up the service system and let the services themselves dictate what's going to happen next. The project infrastructure of Spotify will have created that list of services we are talking about, and we can use it to create an instance of something that we call the service orchestrator. The orchestrator is our main point of communication with the service system, and its job is to process this graph of services and coordinate their use. But before we can use our services, we need to first make sure that they are actually valid. Because services can depend on each other, it's possible for us to have problems like dependency cycles. To avoid these issues, we always validate and process the graph of services before we actually launch the app. For dependency cycles specifically, we can validate our graph by applying a classic depth first search algorithm. 
if I'm able to traverse this graph without falling into a loop, then I know that the graph has no cycles. In other words, we can say that our graph represents a directed acyclic graph, or DAG for short. This sounds super theoretic and boring, but when you're talking about services and, and this architecture, this is actually a very important thing. A DAG can be sorted, and that resulting array will tell us the order in which the services should be used in order for the system to work, as, as you expect. This is called a topological sorting, and we need to respect this order to prevent issues with the state of the services. For example, if I'm going to load all services at once, then I would need to load them in the exact order of this array. But if I'm unloading it, then I need to do the reverse. And this is because of their dependencies. If I don't follow this order, then I cannot predict the availability of the things that they depend on at a particular point in time. Anyway, now that we know that our graph is valid, we are finally ready to launch the app. After building the orchestrator, at some point in the app delegate, we are going to activate our first services scope and load some of the services inside that scope. So we are going to start Spotify by initializing something we call, let's say, a launch scope, which represents services that are absolutely necessary for the app to work, like crash reporting and DOI navigation system itself. But the service system needs to be very careful about this process. Because an app like Spotify has hundreds of modules, I cannot simply load all of our services at once. Launching 400 services at once would cause a noticeable slowdown in the app startup process. So to protect us from that, an important part of the service system is that services can be lazy. They will only be initialized when they're explicitly referenced. So even though our scope is active, nothing is loaded into memory yet. So we are going to continue a large process by initializing a set of services that we need to be available at that point. This is going to cause the services themselves to load, but their dependencies will continue being loaded. The service dependencies are also lazy. They will only be initialized when the parent explicitly references the dependency property wrapper, which basically re re repeats this loading process for that particular service. Later, in the lifecycle of the app, it may happen that we are going to leave a scope. Just like activating a scope allows us to access certain services, deactivating the scope means that we don't need them anymore. In this example, if the user was connected to CarPlay and then decided to shut it down, we can leave that scope as a way to say that those services should not be used anymore. This will cause all services inside the group to be unloaded and deallocated, preventing them from being active in a scenario where we don't actually have CarPlay connected. Anyway, as we have seen, the isolation of each module is critical for a lap of this size. But besides the, the benefits we already talked about when you're making changes to a specific module, this architecture also has the benefit of allowing to run that module in isolation. But think about it. If you have an app the size of Spotify, you likely don't want to build 300 plus modules if all you want to do is run your local changes. If you had a minified version of the app that only contained your module and the things that it needed, you could quickly run and test your changes without having to worry about the rest of the app. For an app with dependence or horizontal dependencies like ours, this is very possible to do. Let's pretend that we have an app with these four features and we would like to run feature A in isolation. Feature A depends on the API of feature B, but the concrete implementation of feature B depends on the two other APIs. If I were to build a minified app for feature A, even though we only really need feature B, we would still need to import the other two features so that feature B itself would work. This might actually be necessary if for some reason you need the actual real feature B to test your changes. But when you develop in isolation, it could actually be better if you didn't. It's like unit testing. The functionality of your class shouldn't depend on a specific dependency being used. It should work regardless of what's plugged into it, as long as it conforms to a specific set of protocols that you're using. So we could really benefit if instead of using the actual feature B, we built a fake version of it that has no dependencies. We can then use this fake to build a working demo app for feature A that can be built in isolation of the rest of the app. 
because we are using the service system, this is actually quite straightforward. When we build a list of services for the service orchestrator, right back in the beginning, instead of saying that features BE, the APIs of feature BE are implemented by the actual feature B services, we simply pass some fake objects instead. These minified demo apps are great for developer productivity, especially when clean builds can take well over half an hour. If you don't need the rest of the app to test a particular change, you can replace them with fakes and create a mini app that builds almost immediately. But perhaps the largest benefit of this architecture is when it comes to navigation. In the previous levels, we always required an explicit reference to a view controller to be able to navigate to it, which is a problem for an app the size of Spotify. But because our example app now has horizontal dependencies, we don't need this anymore. Because dependencies are injected in runtime, it is possible for us to navigate between features without explicitly depending on them. That means that we can freely expand the app and add new UI flows without worrying like what the current flow of the app looks like. And we can actually easily achieve this with the service system. All we need is to have a dedicated service that handles the UI navigation of the app. We have a special abstraction for things that represent UI in general. If a service represents a view controller that can be pushed, we will call the service a page. Each page can represent one or more view controllers and they can freely navigate between each other. The backbone of the page system is a navigation service, which is a class that holds a navigation controller as well as keeping a registry of every page in the app. When our page is initialized, we're going to add our view controller to this registry by telling the navigation service to assign that particular view to a given identifier, like page profile in this case. Later in the app, if someone in another module wants to push that specific page, all they have to do is get this navigation service and ask it to push the view controller assigned under this identifier. As you can see, we don't need to depend on anything besides the navigation service itself to navigate to a given part of the app. We can then break all of these useless dependencies and have a truly isolated architecture that supports dynamic navigation. This allows us to freely play with the entire navigation flow of the app, because if we want to change where a screen leads, really all I need to do is change this identifier to something else. Additionally, because we are using strings as, as identifiers, we can even have our backend control the navigation of the app. Instead of having hard-coded references to view controllers, we can have that information come from the backend so that it can remotely change what the navigation of the app looks like without needing to push new code. This is an amazing tool for A-B testing and marketing in general. And it's also the backbone of backend driven UI like the home of Spotify. We don't have hard-coded references for all of these buttons. They all come from the backend. So as long as these identifiers are valid, the backend can completely change how Spotify looks like. This is incredibly important for the scalability of a level four app. When you have 300 modules, and potentially hundreds of A-B tests going on at once, you would like your code to be as flexible as possible. And an app that has a runtime dependency injection engine like the service system, plus dynamic navigation will allow you to do that, will allow you to do as many of these tests as you want. But for reference, backend driven UI in Spotify is handled by a different framework called Hubs Render, but the navigation aspect of it is handled by the system that I've shown to you. So we have went through a lot of steps to reach this stage. We started with a small single module app and progressively added more features until we reached something the level of Spotify. And what you might have noticed is that the larger we got, the more problems we had to solve. I think it's not an under, understatement to say that evolving an app is an, an exponential problem. The farther you are in this graph, the harder it will be to reach the next level. I am not sure what a level five app would look like today, but I can definitely say that it would probably be extremely difficult to pull off. So I would like to wrap this talk by giving you some advice on how to absorb this information. As someone who participates a lot in the community, I see a lot of people sharing opinions like, oh, we should use this architecture because this company said it's good, or I'm going to develop my own service system because 
Bruno said that Spotify uses it, so we must use it too. And I don't think that's the way to go. That's definitely not the way to go. It is not that you shouldn't mimic these companies, it's that you should evaluate if your app actually has the necessity of using these things. As you can see here in the slide and from what we talked about, the architectural evolution of the app is a progressive thing that results out of issues that we have when things get too big for us to manage. So if you prematurely try to make this evolution, you're going to be solving problems that you didn't even need to solve. It will definitely look awesome in the end, but it's going to be a waste of time. So I would suggest you to be careful about premature optimizations. Don't try to jump the gun. Try to solve problems that you actually have. With that said, if one day your app starts having the problems that Spotify had in the past, then I hope that you're going to be able to use this talk to make your own level four app. I tweet a lot about iOS development. So if you want to learn more about this or just chat with me, feel free to follow me and ping me at rockbruno underscore. Thank you.